Uh, welcome to our webinar. So glad everyone's had a chance here to catch up a little bit. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat here. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Today, we're talking about fire codes and chemical inventories and you, right? How this all relates. This can be a good opportunity if anyone has specific questions for our panel of experts, right? This is, this is your day. Um, and this is our second webinar that we're doing in this, this series, our last one a little while ago here. A lot of interest. We got a ton of questions. It was a great time. Um, so able to to regroup here today, and I would like to introduce. Right here we go. I'd like to introduce our panelists on today's webinar. Um, so first we have Sarah Akio. She's a senior process safety engineer at Decker North America. Sarah, would you like to give a little introduction here? Uh, sure. Uh, just the. Thanks for having me here today. And just so that everybody knows, um, I'm a practicing process safety engineer living in Indianapolis, but I'm often traveling all over to help people out with all sorts of um, challenges that they have as they're working with research, scale up and manufacturing. I'm usually with hazardous materials. So I've got about a 20 year career working um, for all sorts of brands like uh, Eli Lilly, Stepin and Dow DuPont. And most recently joined the Decker Enterprise about three years ago. So I'm excited to be a part of the panel and hope that I can provide a different perspective, especially as research slowly shifts over to the production space. Um, any questions that people have there and some challenges that they might need to overcome in doing some of that. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. We're glad to have you on today's panel as well. Uh, next up, we have Jeff, our R&D Lab Process Safety Technology Leader coming from Dow. Jeff, would you like to give a little introduction here? Sure. Um, so my uh, primary you know, background here, uh, chemical engineers started out in manufacturing areas, moved into the labs, and shortly after that found my true calling into laboratory safety and facility management, which I've been doing now for about 28 years in lab safety, uh, as well as the facility management part for constructing, building labs, renovating labs all around the world. So I've had a global role for the better part of 20 years here. Uh, now I'm serving as the R&D uh, laboratory process safety. So it's a little different spin that Dow has on it because we actually try to apply the principles of process safety and some of the concepts to our laboratory work within the company. Uh, I also need to, and on behalf of both John and I, we do, we do have to put our little disclaimer in here that uh, both of us do serve on the NFPA 45 technical committee. And anything that we say here is, you know, we're speaking on our own. We're not speaking on behalf of NFPA or the technical committee. I got to get that legal thing in there. Yep. Got it. That's important. Always need that. And of course, we have John here joining us. He's a risk manager and fire marshal coming from University of Texas at San Antonio. John, would you like to give a little introduction here? Would love to. Yes, I've been working in higher education, health and safety for 33 years now. And uh, my first job out of college, first serious job out of college was helping to negotiate the interface between laboratory operations and fire codes. And I've been in that space ever since. Um, and uh, I'm currently with the University of Texas at San Antonio. I've been there for 15 years as the fire marshal. Before that, I was at the uh, small private liberal arts college in Colorado, named the Colorado College, where I went to school and got my chemistry degree. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for joining our panel today. So we have our full panel of experts today. I know I'm not our usual host for these community connection webinars. My name is Serena Schwartzheins. I'm a manager of chemical solutions here at Fireoft. I work with everything to do with ChemTracker. And I'll just be our host today, walk us through the questions. Now I've noticed we already have one question in our chat here. I'm going to ask, we do have, I believe, Chris, we should have our Q&A window here. If you have any questions, please put them in that Q&A section. The chat is open if there's any comments or you want to chat with other attendees here. But when we're going to get to the Q&A a little bit later in the webinar, if you can enter them in that Q&A section, it's going to help all of us make sure that we can get to as many of those as we can today. And with that in mind, I'm going to stop this slide here so we can get into our, our panelists here. And again, go ahead. If there's uh, questions anytime, please put them in that Q&A box. Um, Chris, also on the BIRAF side here with me, should have that open for everyone. So that's available here. So to get started, I want to, to chat with each of you about, you know, just for getting started here. And Jeff, I want to ask you about 
Now, how do you manage inventory when you have multiple research projects or groups that are working in, you know, these shared lab, these shared spaces that are still within one control zone or lab unit? Anything you'd be willing to share with us about that as we're getting started here? Sure. Um, that's one of the key challenges is, uh, as I think everybody on the call knows, and if not by the end of the hour here, you'll certainly know that some of the codes and compliance things can be very, very difficult because there's the international fire code, there's NFPA, there's things like the actual, where are the firewalls? What year was the building built? Uh, what does your landlord you know, impart as additional rules? All mm -hmm. of which may have some different nuances to it or cover different aspects of things. So, uh, one of the key things that I have found is from an EHS professional perspective, finding out exactly where the walls are, where the zones are, which makes sense to all of us, but in order to help communicate that, splitting it out so that the sum of all the little parts, the parts that are still manageable by a particular uh, PI or a particular research group, still add up to the right things for whether that's a hazardous chemical or flammable, and splitting it up so it's a manageable piece. So what I've seen really effective is essentially the list of all the different hazard codes, like out of mm -hmm. the International Fire Code, and dividing it up so that this one lab may have only allowed for um, two gallons of material. And the next lab might have five gallons of material, but they're all still, when you sum up everything that's within the fire zone control zone or the laboratory unit, you still meet all of the appropriate codes, whatever the agreements are with the authority having jurisdictions, all that kind of stuff. But instead of just trying to confuse people with the big stuff, break it out into the work areas and just make sure that overall the systems add up correctly and that way each person just has to manage their own inventory to their subset of the tools so keeping just break it down for everyone yep and, and and keep it nice and simple to something that they can actually manage they don't need to worry about the sum totals i worry about the sum totals and just break up the quantities and uh, yeah i even have procedures where i can allow for people to trade within that zone you know because as long as the sum total is okay if one person needs an extra gallon a person doesn't need the gallon they can trade it off and we're still perfectly fine as long as it's within that zone or lab unit. Absolutely. And Sarah and John, if there's anything you'd like to chime in there, go for it. Otherwise I'll, I'll move on here. So the, the uh, I'll jump in. Um, Serena, thank you. Uh, what, what Jeff says is right. The people who are operating their own little research thing are only focused on their little research thing. And so if you give them what's within 20 yards of their reality and tell them to focus on that, they'll be very much more successful. Um, I think the same is true, uh, Sherry, by the way, for academics. Uh, if you just give the, the research faculty the, the, the 20 yard context, they'll be able to figure it out. Um, and someone has to be the integrator at the top end. But I would say that in these shared spaces, one of the deep concerns that I have with the shared spaces is that there's no protection between the lab work areas from one to the other. And so if there's something happening in a lab work area that's completely benign to that work area, but there's something's happening in the adjacent work area that's utterly hostile to that first work area, we have to find a way to make sure we know what's going in and, and figure out what's compatible with what. And that I'm going to rely on the process safety folks because that really is a management of change process safety skill set. And even though we're not required by law to OSHA or EPA regulations to apply those at laboratory scale, um, because it's usually for larger quantities. Um, the, the process is valid and the outcomes are important. And so understanding if you have a, a, a massively reducing or high fuel, for instance, uh, laboratory operation on one mm -hmm. side of the lab and you have a very oxidizing react, uh, uh, process on the other side, you want to make sure those two are actually physically separated. Um, and there's a lot in a higher ed, there's a lot of academic convenience. Uh, we're going to put these two people together because they work for the, for the same department and they got grants from the same agency. And if the research itself is incompatible, it needs to be moved. And inserting ourselves into that and making sure that we're managing not just giving the, each individual research group their expectations, but also understanding what the friction points are between the research groups. That's to me a big problem uh, that we have to work on solving in those shared spaces. It's easy when everyone's got their own 12 by 12 lab, but it's much more difficult when you've got a, a 10,000 square foot lab and 16 groups working in it. Thanks. Thank you. A lot, a lot to figure out there. Um, next, I wanted to ask, 
John, if you don't mind answering another question here, um, if you had to pick what would be like the one most valuable element of a fire protection program for laboratories, but one element that maybe folks don't do so often, what would you, what would you pick for that? Yeah, so I'm gonna be able to um, reprise what I just said. It's called management of change. And um, getting into a state where the EHS office is constantly evaluating. Uh, Kurt Lewin has an eight step process for management of change. Uh, most of us are in agreement with the eighth step, which is implement the change, but many of mm -hmm. us are not in agreement with the first seven steps, which are <laughs> things like get leadership buy-in and get a volunteer army, get a vision. Uh, most people are ready to just move to the next thing. Um, and if I, I've, in fact, at a, at a, a conference just now, this is why I'm in Florida, uh, I presented yesterday on uh, management of change as a foundational principle for a safety program, a chemical safety program. And uh, that's, I, I truly believe that that's a direction that we have to be moving. We have to be much more agile and much more fit and much more nimble and much more limber than we currently are. We are dinosaurs and we don't like changing, uh, but the science is changing all around us. And if we're not keeping up, we're gonna find ourselves on the wrong end of the headlines. So management of change, uh, just do a little research on that. If you want to look up Kurt Lewin's model and, uh, or John Cotter has another, I think John Cotter has the eight point model, Lewin has a three point model. Both of those are valid. Uh, find a management of change process that you can identify with and then start thinking about how you'd apply it to your program. And I think that's the one thing that I would try to change in every program. About the people management? The, the change management. So understanding the, the, the things that are changing. Of course, the people change. That's part of your process. But, um, but certainly the, 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 the goals and the functions, what's actually being done in the research, uh, just keeping up with that. Uh, if we can stay on top of that, we're going to make better decisions. Sarah, Jeffrey, anything you've run into change management, your experience you want to share here? I couldn't agree more. Um, of course, I can't share details, but I might share general concepts of things that I, I uncover because I've been to a lot of different facilities. A great example of that in fire protection was a laboratory that um, was old. It didn't have many sprinklers. Mm -hmm. And someone decided to bring in um, flammable samples and tiny little ounce bottles. They were small, but somewhere along the line, they ended up with thousands of these. And so you might as well have just rolled in, I mean, gallons and gallons of jugs of flammable solvent because what was never intended in that space, suddenly it was a hazardous materials lab. And if you can imagine every bench, every shelf, every ledge, had these itty bitty bottles everywhere full of alcohol. And um, people knew it was flammable, but no one ever perceived what if, what if someone starts a fire, even if it's a waste right. basket fire, what the consequences could be. And the fact that it had, didn't have adequate sprinkler protection, let alone egress because of some other concerns, they really didn't internalize what they had there was a true risk that they were somehow blind to, even though they knew the alcohol was flammable. So that's one example of managing change. At some point, there needs to be a gentle reminder. Do you think we've impacted the design of this space or maybe the risk profile of the space? And it's just a tickler, a reminder, maybe we need to reconsider what we're doing or perhaps change the space. You know, is there something else we need to install? Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree. The management of change is, is fundamental and key. I mean, the the nature of, other than maybe some teaching laboratories, but at least in research in both university and in industry, uh, changes the way of life. If you ever do the same experiment mm -hmm. twice in R&D, you're wasting time. You know, it's going to be something different all the time. So the challenge with the change management piece is to come up with the right screening, the right tools so that you don't make the change management process so cumbersome to the researchers that they feel that, that you know, it's just safety. It puts a big wall up around them versus something where you can quickly screen or quickly help them to get to the point where they can understand the magnitude of the change that they're trying to make. Absolutely. Thank you all. I think we'll probably revisit that. I see there's something the Q&A will get to reaching back about management of change here. Definitely a hot topic. Um, Sarah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about 
right? Your career, you've worked with both small and large scale operations, including even all the way up to like pilot plant activities, right? A little bit in the middle there. What are some of the most common gotchas that you've seen these research groups run into, encounter regarding these hazardous materials as they're growing, right? Thinking about chains, right? During that growth process. No, sure. And there's a lot of different answers I could provide so, so that we don't talk about that topic for the whole hour. I mean, try to keep it short and brief because I'm sure Jeff and John are going to say something. Um, you know, if there's something that can be generalized that I can think hit both academics and, and, and you know, private laboratories and, and companies, um, just know that when you're growing, there's two components, okay? One is you're typically introducing a lot of new, um, new risk. Okay, it may not be worse risk, it's just new, all right? You're, you're developing, you're growing, you're bringing in new chemicals or energy or technology. It depends on your research, okay? And you really know your topic, whatever that science might be. But the risk part may not be something that you fully understand, okay? There, there, there might be part of it that is clear to you, but not the full thing. And what I like to tell my groups are, and, and you guys can laugh at this analogy, is we like to call it the lions and the tigers, okay? Everybody sees the lions, but they maybe don't understand where the tigers are hiding, okay? Because the tigers are a little bit like ninjas. They're hard to find. And a tiger can kill you. You know, it may look tame, but it's not. And it's, it's the fact that if you bring a compressed gas uh, like hydrogen into your lab, it's not the same as compressed air. There's a tiger hiding in there. Um, and we know hydrogen ignites, but maybe you fully don't understand the consequence of that volume of hydrogen and what it can do. And I just offer that as an example. We could go on about tigers all day, about different tigers that are hiding. But often researchers are very passionate about the lions, but somehow they're either blinded to or they don't see the full picture of where those tigers are. And ways to kind of counter that that I would suggest, so I don't leave you guys hanging, is I always suggest a three-pronged approach. One is you, you bring different perspectives to a change that you're making, to John's point. Different perspectives, not groupthink. You know, number of people sometimes doesn't matter, but bring those different perspectives in and be willing to listen to them and, and figure out where those tigers are. The second thing is to make sure that um, you're plugged into some kind of routine uh, knowledge sharing so that you're aware of tigers. Sometimes you're blind to them because you don't know they exist. So it, whatever, you know, like attending this webinar is a great example but somehow challenge yourself to learn about hazards, not just your science, you know, find the tigers. And the third thing is, is I would say um, organizational um, sensitivity to leadership. Even if you're not a people manager, if you're attending a webinar space like this, you're probably a leader somehow. You influence someone in your lab or your research area. What you say and what you don't say matters. So think about it and challenge yourself and be willing to say, what do I say or don't say that helps people either find the tigers or hide the tigers? And, and that might cause you to do better in that space. And, and there's probably more we can add, but um, that's, that's generally where we figure risk blindness. How do, you, how do you get people to see what they can't see? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Jeff or, or John, want to weigh in on this? Well, I'd, I'd go a little more literal on the question, looking at the concept of scale up. Uh, one of the most mm. fundamental things that I typically see is recognizing that volume and surface area don't go up the same way. And so things like um, your heating doesn't always apply the same way, the mixing, your auto ignition. So some of the hazards grow a lot quicker because of that ratio of volume to surface area. And a lot of times that gets forgotten that when you're working with a small scale thing in a fume hood, which has real high airflow and relatively speaking, a very high surface area, doesn't always behave the same when you go up in order of magnitude and scale. Excellent. Yeah, I think I, I think uh, Jeff's made a great point. And if you want to illustrate that point, um, you could consider uh, dropping uh, a watermelon and a grape off of a four story building and see how things go. <laughs> um, the scale up. So you drop the grape and everything looks fine. Right. And so this is what Jeff's talking about volume and mass. They, they, they don't scale the same. Um, you drop a grape and it survives fine, but you drop a watermelon and it doesn't. And that's exactly the point he's, he's trying to make, I think, is that um, you have to be very careful and consider what the ramifications are on multiple, on multiple facets of that scale up. 
A lot, a lot involved there. Okay, I'd like to move to our next topic. So this is when we start talking about this for anyone who is in our water cooler chat before we officially get started. Uh, we want to talk, you know, a little bit of what have you found, right? Any of you three, what have you found where people are storing their special inventory? What's the story there? And what hazards and requirements did they miss? So yeah, I, I will take a stab at that to start because uh, thanks to Sarah who you know sent along the bingo card with what she thought would be a challenging set of things as to where <laughs> you might find uh, creatively stored samples and inventory and uh, manage that way. Um, and I filled in almost the entire bingo card and found one that wasn't even on her card. So I mean, truly managing these things does, you know, it, it, it's a challenge. I mean, there's always going to be creative things you know clearly a better you know a good place to put liquid samples would be into an appropriate approved flammable cabinet that is the right answer um you know however i have walked into labs where the bottom of the cabinets were actual uh, not flammable cabinets but like overhead cabinets you know the mm -hmm. above the shelf cabinets where the shelves had dipped down because of the mass of all of the chemicals to where you could see bottles underneath the bottom rail because the bottom of the cabinet was almost falling out. Um, you know, it's the, the creative storage of things, people, you know, get things and leave them and uh, management of change when somebody leaves, uh, when a person graduates or when a person goes to a new project, you know, th that process is gonna be really key. How do you clean out their lab and reassign everything? How do you find all that? And so a good chemical management system is, is gonna be real key for that to make sure you can find that stuff. Uh, and the other thing I'd throw in as a suggestion is the the inadvertent stuff. Um, people are people. When materials arrive, they don't always go where you think they're going to go, and they can get accumulated, like in a receiving room or someone who gets the you know the the plain cardboard box in that may have some DOT stickers on it or something. But the person doesn't work in that building because it got sent to the wrong building, or they put it aside thinking that they would get it. Uh, you know, a lot of times this is how you end up with stuff that could be a very old and the real scary ones are the ones where you have the signs on them saying, you know, refrigeration required and you find them tucked away in the bottom of a broom closet because they didn't know where to go. So, yeah, you can find these things all over the place on this. Um, I think I'll uh, add that, Jeff. Yeah, go. Yeah, Donna, I'll let you do. I'm sure we all have stories about where we found things. I, I would say the most common ones that become a problem is... Um, People need floor space, so wherever they find the floor or the shelf, that's where they put it. Um, hallways, egress doors, uh, it could even be a closet. I've seen things in break rooms, locker rooms. It's like, it's as if someone said, we have some floor space, it's, it's there for, if it fits, it's okay. And they didn't really think through what's in the bottle, the, the drum, the pail, the, whatever it might be let alone, um, you know, if there's special storage requirements for the material. So um, often I know when I walk through spaces, uh, if I see um, indication of, of someone's using a closet or there's also the very infamous shed or lean to that shows up right next to the exit door. I've had it in multiple locations and, and people mean well, they mean well, they think there's a logic behind where they put it, where they put it. And um, there's just, again, they're, they're blind to the risk. They don't understand that there might be uh, um, building code, fire code, environmental, or, or process safety requirements for what they've just done. <laughs> so my experience is with not-for-profits, uh, op organizations operating in the public benefit, and uh, public benefit organizations pay every bill with opportunity costs. So what we spend on this, we cannot spend on that. And the value of that is also lost. What we would do with that, that value is also lost when we spend it on this. So my experience is that most of the faculty that I've worked with are very, very parsimonious and they would like to preserve every penny of their grant funding so that they can maximize the knowledge that they're creating. That's a, that's a, a morally just approach. And when it comes to um, storing those very spiky materials, uh, they may put them aside saying, I, I may need this in the future, right? So that's, the, that's always what they say. I may, but we, we might find a use for this later. Um, the problem is that many of these things need to be stored by themselves. They're just not friendly with anything else. And so in my stockroom at Colorado College, we had um, all of the, the standard hazard classes, right? So flammable, oxidizing, corrosive, poison, none of the above. 
And then we had the special hazards box and we had to understand what was in the special hazards box and make sure that everything in that box was compatible with each other in case it got all mixed up because of some reason. And even then we had stuff that would needed to be dry and that stuff was held outside the special hazards box in a special desiccating box. Um, and it ended up being my job to be the one who uh, replaces the desiccant just to make sure that the, the P205 remains, the phosphorus pentoxide remains a free flowing, flowing powder and doesn't turn into phosphoric acid. It's the most hydroscopic material known. Um, so absorbs water from everywhere. And um, that's the challenge. So they buy the material, they buy enough for what they're going to do. Maybe they buy extra and then they hold on to it thinking that they may have to replicate that in some way. And all of that takes space and all of that takes time. And the answer for that is to just spend more money getting rid of the stuff. And nobody wants to spend money getting rid of stuff. They just want to hold on to it because maybe they'll need it later. And the reality is that this stuff will eventually degrade or fall off the shelf or something. And unless you take action. And so it, you, my mother called this being ruthless when she was gardening. She said, I don't care if that's a beautiful plant. I'm growing flowers here. So this is a weed and I'm going to take this weed out. And that's the, I think we have to be heartless when it comes to that. We have to be, uh, we have to be absolutely ruthless uh, in dealing with these spiky inventories. I really don't care how many standardized steel, steel samples they, the analytical lab keeps. That's okay with me. The whole building is made of steel. Um, it's fine. But I really care how much uh, I don't know sodium amide they have, <laughs> um, and especially the old stuff. Thanks. And I'm gonna just add a little bit onto what John was saying there. I mean, there's uh, when you go out and buy chemicals, and this also addresses one of the comments in the question. You know, how how do you introduce some of these management things? Mm -hmm. uh, you'll notice that you know the the chemical suppliers do not. I mean, they have technical grade, analytical grade. They do not have museum grade, and. Um, you know, I have seen where people have filed for patents on bad data because their chemicals were so old that it wasn't the actual chemical they thought it was. And that makes it very difficult to you know, do replicability or to do real science if you don't know exactly what you're working with. So a good method to manage change on this is to be able to talk, you know, if the chemical is going to be sensi uh, sensitive to time, uh, you know, changing over time, autocatalytic or anything like that, you really want to make sure that you turn over the inventory, you get it taken care of, you get it removed on a prompt basis, because if you just accumulate it, you know, for the, the, the joy of having a, a really old sample bottle, um, it, you're probably not gonna be able to actually use it to get the results you want in terms of the research. Won't always be exactly what it says on the label. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone here. As we're getting to the next question, I'd like to remind our audience, Feel free to chat in the chat box there. And if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A section there. If you also wanna go to the Q&A section for our audience, if there's any questions you in particular like there, there's a little thumbs up button. Um, so that'll move questions up in the queue there for our Q&A section as we, we get a little further along here. Okay, the next topic I'd like to cover um, for our panelists is what do you wish people knew or what do you wish people would ask you about chemical inventory requirements for fire code compliance and safety. Um, I'll go. I um, uh, part of NFPA forty five, and it's in fact written and it's expressed in the uh, international code too. So, both fire codes agree that um, you can't bring something into a space that the space is not prepared to handle. And so, uh, what I would like to find out uh, is it's really not a question of, of answering the question. We'll answer the question eventually. What I'd like to do is answer the question earlier. So instead of saying, I have this stuff and now I'm using it this way and could you come over and clean up the spill that resulted from the container being incompatible with the material, I would rather get the question at the idea phase where they say, is it okay with you if we, or do you have ideas for how we would integrate this material into our research? and uh, if they ask the question in advance, then we can say things like, uh, that's not going to work out and here's why. And my example is that we had a, a researcher who was doing experimentation on phytoremediation, which is using plants to clean up pollution. Uh, and they caught on to the idea that uh, there is a plant that eats, uh, that uptakes trinitrotoluene, uh, toluene rather, and metabolizes it. 
And so you not only stable, you not only remove the explosive from the environment, but you also metabolize it into something else, dispose of it at the same time. Well, this is astonishing research. We found out about it when they sent over um, uh, six or eight uh, five gallon buckets of dirt mixed with TNT, which is very difficult to dispose of. And we would much rather have started with the idea and then built a plan for how they were gonna manage the material and manage the waste and then decide whether or not that's something that we wanna do. Um, and so really it's a question of getting involved earlier in the process. Excellent. John, I think you had a great answer there. I would just build on that a little bit. Um, that You hit a point that I think I was gonna to hit too, but uh, I wish more people came to me and knew what they do. I know that sounds a little silly, but uh, kind of coming back to that shared lab space maybe a little bit, but a lot of fire code compliance and inventory management is knowing what you have and knowing what your space is. And, and so many times when we talk to people, they really don't know what they have or what, what folks are doing in that space and not just their lab, but the space. And, and oftentimes, I know it sounds so simple, a walkthrough and just writing down, you know, the materials in the lab and the construction of the lab um, or the spaces they're using, whatever they may be, the sheds, the lean to, mm -hmm. whatever, it really opens their eyes because if you can get everyone to commonly agree what they're doing with the full uh, landscape and ecosystem of what they're doing, not just maybe one little part of it, as well as what, what is in those spaces, sometimes the solutions are more obvious because it just, everybody knows what's going on. And then we realize maybe we don't need the museum grade. <laughs> <laughs> a bucket of whatever they've got in there, or we, we, we self-identify concerns. And what that does is, 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 especially if you want to pay someone like me to help you out, um, you might decide you don't need help because you just don't want it there, or, or you don't want that shedder lean to used. And I, I can tell you story after story of just getting people to agree what's actually in the space has really solved the problem, <laughs> as simple as it is. <laughs> Everyone on the same page. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, glad we covered, right? What do you wish people knew? Our next topic, I forget if we've gotten a question about this one already, but what do you do with unsprinkled labs and the quantities in them? You know, we had a story early on, right? So you talked about all the little, little bottles of flammables, right? In this lab that was not designed for it. So what are your suggestions about, you know, what do you do in that situations, right? Where we have these labs, they're older, they're just not really well equipped. Well, and I'll, I'll, I'll start on that one. I mean, there's really two things for that. Um, you know, obviously Dow's been around for, you know, hundred and some odd years now. And uh, we have labs that are not quite that old, but uh, in, in that ballpark. Uh, so, you know, part of it is to understand, I mean, there's two hurdles you have you have to get over the higher bar of whichever hurdle you're looking at. There's a risk management component and then there's a code compliant component. So a lot of the older labs um, might have been built uh, before, and I'll go with like NFPA 45, uh, put in the requirement that all labs will be sprinkled. I think that was back in like the 2004 or 2000 edition. So you get something older than that, there may not have been sprinklers and they may not have been required by code. So you'd still look at for the code compliance hurdle, what was the code that was in effect for the building? You know, are you actually meeting that? As far as the risk management portion goes, typically the quantities in a unsprinkled lab were historically about half the quantities that are covered by a sprinkler. That's also in the international fire code side. And the most important thing on the risk management piece then becomes you know, flammable cabinets, uh, solvent cans, and more importantly, inventory reduction. You know, these things are your friends. You, know, you wanna make sure that you minimize the amount that you have to have in that space and that you use very effectively you know, the solvent cans, solvent cabinets. The other thing to consider is even in the experiments and in the fume hoods and things like that, putting in spill containment. Um, trying to limit the surface area as to how much, how big of a fire you could get and what that impact will be. It'll burn a little longer if you have a you know, good spill containment. Um, 
And along those lines, one other little thing on spill containment, I have seen way too many plastic spill containments, which are not really effective in the middle of a fire. So metal spill containment or something that's non-combustible is really going to be important on that. Uh, don't, don't build your spill containment out of fuel. Well, that's a good, good point, Jeff. And I'd say that there are some plastics out there that are good in fire, like PVC. Oh, so um, the, yeah, know, pick, but... pick, picking the right resin is important. Um, from my point of view, as a risk manager, I'll, I'll put in that one of the risks that we have to uh, guard against is a reputational risk. So if we knew mm -hmm. that sprinklers were a good idea and we had money sitting around and we chose not to sprinkle the lab and then the lab blows up in a fire and people die, there'll be a conversation about whether or not that was the, the appropriate use of funds. And uh, anyone who doesn't want to be on the wrong end of that conversation at the news podium or in the boardroom should probably be prioritizing their insurance company's recommendations for putting in sprinklers. Um, I appreciate that that's an expensive job and sometimes you might view it as cost prohibitive, but the truth is you get an awful lot of fire protection out of a little bit of sprinkler. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, John. Sarah, is there anything you wanted to add about that or should I go ahead and move no, on? I think both these guys hit it. I, I, I just keep coming back to what problem are you trying to solve? And, and that's, that's many of the, the things I run into. I mean, what is the, what are you trying to do? What, what is the purpose of the fire protection? It has got multiple facets into risk, insurance, um, you know, life safety. There could be a lot of different reasons. And I also look at the context of the ask. Are we talking about an existing unit? Are we talking about a new unit? Are you bringing in a new ignitable material that you've never had before? Because that might change how I approach the answer. <laughs> um, because if you're asking about unsprinkled, there's other things you need to take a look at. It, it's, it's more than fire protection. Um, there might be something else that we need to talk about. Complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> <Definitely> complicated. <laughs> Okay, our next topic we wanted to cover. I feel like we touched on this one a little bit here, but you know, laboratories, they're often run by very smart people, right? You can name all the degrees, the accomplishments, the brilliance. Um, but these people, right, they're sometimes blind to the hazardous material requirements, right? That's not their expertise, not not what they think about every day regarding building and fire code issues, you know, very important. Um, what are some of these these requirements that you found that people, right, particularly our scientists or researchers are sometimes blind to that they need to address as inventories grow? I'll answer that and let people pile on um, because I run into this a lot, especially with scale up. Uh, in fact, I just worked with someone on this this week. Um, sometimes we throw around the word laboratory like it's, it's magical and somehow it makes you exempt <laughs> from risk, <laughs> let alone, let alone um, government requirements. Um, I always tell people first, you know, we need to recognize that, that when you're working with hazardous energy, whether that's chemical, electrical, pressure, we need to remember there is risk associated with it and it doesn't care if you're in a laboratory, a shed, outdoors. You need to be mindful of that, right? And, and protect yourself and others and first responders from that risk. The next part is the requirements. Um, you can start locally, your building code, your fire code. You can then go up as a step up either to your state or, or your federal level and say, look, OSHA, they've got requirements on flammable liquids, on process safety management, on compressed gas. Um, the word laboratory, we throw that around. You gotta be very careful because you may not be as much of a laboratory as you think. And there's often sometimes no exemption for a laboratory in some of those spaces. So. I don't know why, why we got to the, there in some, some people's heads, but, but read them, look at the scopes, take a look at what they're talking about. Um, you, it may apply. Process safety management has actually come up a couple of times because the quantities there that, that you need to exceed to make that required are sometimes only hundreds of pounds. And you bring one cylinder, one drum in, and all of a sudden you're PSM covered. And uh, that, that's, that's a lot of work and, and it's something to really take seriously. Also, the EPA has their environmental requirements, but they also have the risk management plan, which is the sister regulation of PSM. And again, they have different amounts and quantities, and sometimes some research spaces run into that. 
I think the last one I'd mention is the Department of Homeland Security. Now, a lot of you say, well, certainly we're a laboratory, it wouldn't apply. Sometimes all you need is a pail of certain substances, which I don't want to encourage anyone about some of the substances I'd mention, <laughs> but they are bomb making materials. And, and maybe that wasn't obvious to you when you got the material because you're not a nefarious person. You're not someone who's out to get somebody. So, so you need to be very sensitive to that, that uh, dust, not you know powders kind of fall in this, not just liquids and gas. So you need to think holistically about that and, and go to places like here and learn about those requirements because you need to do your due diligence and be responsible and in alignment with them. And Jeff and John, I don't know if I missed anything. What, what else is out there? <laughs> I'm gonna check the Jeff on this one. <laughs> no, I I think you're you know right, spot on there, Sarah. The um, the blindness to the you know some of those requirements because there are a lot of legal hurdles you know and there's still also the the risk hurdles. Uh, you know, you mentioned some of the things like you know what is a laboratory. Well, one of the key things that I think when you think of laboratories is that there's some inherent controls that are are in laboratories. You know, most production units don't run in, you know, without a fume hood or run outside of a fume hood and stuff. So you do have better ventilation, you know, what direction the hazard's likely going to come at you from. It's not all around you, like in a production area. Uh, and when you are talking laboratory, and I, you know, whether it's OSHA or NFPA or um, even some of the International Fire Code stuff, you're talking about some much more stringent requirements that add some additional protections and add some quantity limitations in order to get that flexibility to be able to, to operate within that laboratory. And yeah, some of those Department of Homeland Security stuff, you, you, you're actually in the smaller than pale quantities for some of those ones too. Um, and, and that's a really you know, great point there that you know, if, you, if you do have the right method to keep track of your inventory, someone who understands those things can be able to take a look at that and make sure that we're still going well. Um, you know, that's the other thing I would suggest that, you know, blind to the hazard side of stuff, uh, PV equals NRT. Uh, everybody learned that in their freshman chemistry classes, mm -hmm. but very few people think to apply that and actually understand the fact that when you heat up your closed bottle, um, it's going to get pressure and it's going to get significant pressure potentially. Um, you know, you start generating a, a, a gas as part of your reaction and you will build pressure. And most of the incidents that I have seen tend to start off somewhere with a pressure failure. And just trying to remember that that freshman chemistry class, you know, it's not just for when you're in school to do the solve the problem. There's a real application to that. And, you know, when you, an example that I give new, new engineers and chemists coming in when, during their orientation is, you know, uh, with an ex, with a reaction that generates you know pressure i give them intentionally give them something that comes up to about like 500 pounds of pressure inside their sample bottle most glass sample bottles do not handle 500 pounds particularly well therefore the actual answer is zero because the thing has already gone to opened itself up to atmosphere but yet everybody goes out to like nine decimal points because that's what their calculator told them the answer was so applying the concept of pv equals nrt is a big one yeah, I remember in grad school, first thing I was taught, no pressure changes on a closed system. I mean, sometimes <laughs> you have to, but I know what you're right. doing there. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the, the only uh, lay-in I have on top of that is uh, it's uh, often necessary to be very specific about what you want when you're dealing with folks who have risk blindness. And so if you're dealing with a pharmaceutical uh, researcher, you say, we need a list of all your hazardous materials, and they send back something that includes no flammable liquids. Um, you clearly don't share a definition of hazardous. And mm -hmm. so if we had said we need a list of all of your combustible, flammable, corrosive, or everything that has this kind of signal or marking on it, or everything from this list, et cetera, uh, we would have gotten different results. But what we ended up with was a, a lab that's clearly an organic synthesis lab that reported that they had about two and a half gallons of flammable solvent, and it just didn't pass the sniff test. So when we went and checked, they had more like 50 gallons which wasn't a lot for that lab. It was just way more than they reported, but it's because they were blind to the idea that a solvent is a hazardous material. And so then you have to remember to speak their language or to give them a, a decoder ring that helps them speak your language. And I just layer on that, John, that's gotten me several times with dust. Someone, I, I did a, a similar assignment to someone and aluminum powder didn't end up on the list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
it, it's it's often something they miss. Yeah. <laughs> Right the there. other thing that's sometimes useful on that is the, you know, the, the analogy that, you know, that little squirt bottle full of toluene that they're using to casually clean glassware with, uh, a sixteenth of a gallon of toluene still moves a one ton vehicle about 30 miles. Yeah. Um, so yeah. There, there's a lot of energy in those little squirt bottles that not a lot of people think about. Yep. I get desensitized to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's look at our next one. And then after that, we're going to go into the q and I know we have some questions uh, building up here, but just want to cover what are some best practices you recommend regarding the communications and engagement of all the key parties? And we touched on this in our last fair code webinar. This is a hot one. John, I might let you take this one first. I know you might have a battery situation there. Uh, yes, I am I'm unprepared, so no charger and remote. Um, Don't worry about it. Uh, so I'll drop when I drop. But um, yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, the key question is uh, helping, it's back to language, um, helping folks understand the necessity of the conversation. And if left to their own devices, they will have the conversation they want to have. Uh, and if that conversation doesn't include all of the risk factors that we need to be thinking about, well, it's not going to include them. And the result will be that those, those risk factors don't get talked about. So I think that the, the necessary conversation is finding what motivates them and bringing them to the table using their motivators. And uh, that may not be as simple with a tenured faculty member, for instance, as threatening their job, because you really can't do that. I mean, it's not going to work. It's not going to go well. You can do it. We have fired people over safety, but it didn't go well. And uh, you'll end up in court. Uh, but you need to find the motivation that actually works for them. And that's actually house to house fighting. Uh, faculty are not the same. They're not homogenous and they each have their own set of motivations. And so from my point of view, it's about being curious. It's about being optimistic and it's about being very, very patient and uh, looking and for and finding the motivation and trying to connect with each of them as individuals and then have a serious conversation about what matters to them. I get traction when I talk to people about your research will be more useful if you finish your work as opposed to watching it blow up or <laughs> go up in smoke. And they say, I want that to happen. And then I say, good, now we're, now we're after the same thing. And we go from there. Excellent. If I lose power, I'm at 1%. So if I lose power, guys, it's been a real pleasure. Always happy to be part of these conversations. Thank you, John. Okay, Sarah or Jeff? Yeah, I, I'll, I completely agree with what John just said there as far as the engagement of individual parties. The other part of that is to make sure that you get all of the parties identified. So taking the time to think through you know, who all are stakeholders in this, because it's the, the people who are doing the research plus the project managers or you know, leadership or the PIs, uh, you also have the facility managers from the building. The responders um, do have a stake because if they have to come and drag somebody out of a burning building, they're not too happy about that. Um, you know, that's they're putting themselves at risk because of that work. So, you know, the, the authority having jurisdiction, the fire marshals, I mean, there's a lot of different people, EHS, uh, that all have a stake in this and getting them all at the same time to be part of that conversation because everybody brings something unique. I think Sarah, you said earlier, you know, getting that diversity of opinions is really important. Um, and that's where you, you know, after you've identified that list of, or that collection of people, then trying to find that common ground that John's talking about, you know, the making sure that you can get them to realize, you know, most everybody doesn't want to go home hurt you know, and how do we all work together to try to make that happen as best as possible? And the, I think the only thing I'm gonna add because you guys put it on very well, um, I explain it to people this way. This might just be a different way of saying the same thing. Um, you know, if, if there's two key things that you have to, actually three key things you have to get right collectively and you hope that they all align because then that gives you power. One is, why do we manage risk? There's a lot of different reasons, but like John said so well, some of it is our safety because we're friends and neighbors. Some of it's the public's. I, I, I'm surprised by the number of people that feel very differently and talk about first responders because nobody wants to kill a firefighter. I, they just don't. Um, that changes things for people when you mention that point of view, as well as their own apparatus or experiment they don't want to 
see that burn up either. You need a common vision that we care about each other and the work that we're doing. The second thing you need is engagement from the right stakeholders and Jeff and John mentioned that really well. And, and the third, and it's not in any priority, is sponsorship. And you need someone other than the safety guy that sponsors this idea that we will operate in a way that is responsible. And responsible means nobody gets hurt, we don't burn up our experiments, and it will be done in accordance to the law. And if you get a good sponsor who understands their job is to sponsor, not support, but to sponsor, that means we're going to focus on this. We're going to shift resources if they must be shift, shifted. We will stop work. We will change staffing in order to get this common vision correct. And you've got engagement and the right vision. It works. You'll figure it out. Great. Well, great advice here. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Sarah here. Um, at this point, we have nine minutes left on our scheduled time here. I'm going to move us over to our Q&A section here. So again, if anyone has any questions, put them in the Q&A or vote on the questions there. There's a little thumbs up button you can hit. If there's a question right? you'd like us to make sure to get to here. I'll get to as many of these as we can. Um, our first question here was from Patrick Ryan asking, what are the greatest barriers your encounter re moc i think that's management of change here i'm sure there's a lot <laughs> start with my number one thing i encountered with research groups and labs is even acknowledging they're making a change <laughs> <laughs> the first step to solving a problem is recognizing you have one and it, that is often a difficult uh a difficult way is to get them to recognize i am making a change i should probably check in with someone <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think the, you know, because the, especially in the R and D's parts, uh, research and development that I've been parts of change is a way of life. So, you know, like Sarah was saying, you may not recognize that there actually was impact of that change, you know, but you're always making changes constantly. So you become a little uh, immune to it, or at least recognizing it. So I, to, to me, I think the biggest barrier is the processes that have been put in place to try to manage that change. I mean, I know that the bureaucracy that I have seen, not just at the various places where I have worked, but, you know, going through other locations, other places I've, you know, had tours of and stuff is there's tends to be a fairly heavy bureaucracy associated to manage those changes. So trying to align the MOC process with the level of risk that needs to be in place. Thank you. I think the, the barrier that, Adios. Boop, boop, boop. Oh. Oh. Well, good we had John. Well, well, we did. Okay. Let's look at um, let's see. Our next. Oh, someone asked about the bingo card. I think that's about where you found samples. So Sarah, I'll leave it to you if that's one you want to share. Uh, we can officially share the bingo card. <laughs> yeah, you might. You, everyone might be on their own making their. You know, if anyone wants to make a, a bingo card, anyone in the audience, and send it out, uh, we'd love to share that with folks. At our next webinar, send it to the attendees here. So maybe send us your bingo card. What you imagine there? Okay. Next question. This one's from Linda Vatura here asking, can you discuss hot plates and similar equipment with their use of flammables? Do you need an intrinsically safe unit if it is used in a fume hood? Can you discuss LFLs won't be reached to the exhaust? Assuming four to eight liters present in the fume hood, how does your facility handle this? So a pretty specific question here. All right, so I, I will take that one at least as a starting point here. And the answer is very clearly it depends. Um, <laughs> the, uh, no, um, depends really on like, like the type of solvent and everything that's in there because some of them are going to be more volatile than others. The actual configuration in the hood would also matter. The spill containment is going to matter. Generally, and this is, don't quote me on this for every situation, but generally the fume hood is going to provide sufficient dilution that the actual flammable zone will be very, very tight to the surface of the liquid. So the odds of getting an ignition source in there are going to be very small. And that's why, at least like if you look at NFPA 45, you would say that a fume hood would be rated standard. That's sort of the default setting. But there's the little asterisk saying that unless it's not. Now, if you put something like the hot plate down inside the spill containment to where if you do have a spill, it's going to flood the hot plate, you got a whole separate problem there because now you don't have the airflow around it. You don't have the ventilation and you're going to likely have the fire that's going to occur. 
Um, the other thing about the hot plates themselves is always to keep in mind, you know, PV equals NRT, always a good thing on hot plates. Um, and to also remember that even though when we talk about flammables, most often we think of things like flashpoint as the governing thing for flammables. That's how flammables are typically defined, boiling point and flashpoint. There's also this thing called auto ignition temperature. Don't forget about that because the hot plate itself, if you're over the auto ignition temperature, it doesn't matter whether you have intrinsically safe or not, it will still catch on fire. It's just basically made your solvent into a pyrophoric material. Thank you. So is that a vague enough answer? But you know, generally, you're going to be okay inside a fume hood. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a scientific answer there. Okay, this next one, there's a little discussion about this one in our Q&A section, which is great. Um, love it. We have our audience members chiming in on these questions. Keep that up, everyone. What are the guidelines for chemicals that don't carry a shelf life and don't have expiration dates noted? So there are some notes here, especially about folks at universities who have teaching labs, um, where they're using older chemicals without expiration dates, looking for some guidelines. Good, good question on that one. Um, you know, as far as chemicals without expiration dates, understand your chemistry. I mean, so, some chemicals truly are not going to change with respect to time and that won't really matter that much. I mean, one, one of my favorite ones with an expiration date without naming a particular uh, national supplier of chemicals, but they actually put expiration dates on five millimeter glass beads. Um, little bit useless there, you know, and not too concerned about the glass beads changing or going bad after an expiration date. Uh, however, other things like uninhibited uh, tetrahydrofuran or something like that, which you know is going to be forming peroxides as soon as it got opened, that's not the same chemical in like three or four days. And therefore, even if there's no expiration date, you need to be getting rid of that. So it really comes down to, my perspective would be is making sure you understand the chemistry. It's a very simple thing to administer to say, hey, anything that's gonna be around three years, whether or not it has an expiration date, toss it. Uh, or maybe it's four years, but it really depends on your, your particular management system on that. Thank you. Okay, great, that's a good one there. I think the um, only thing I would add is I once knew in a lab that after they did the scientific analysis, which Jeff described very well, there was a management decision because they were running out of shelf and floor space and there was so much mm -hmm. turnover in the labs. I think it was, it was like the one-year rule, the two-year rule, I don't recall, and I don't really recall what, the, what, they're, what they were doing. But they, they found a reasonable amount of time where they said, man, if we're still hanging on to it after X, X number of time period, we need to just get rid of it, if nothing else, because it's taking up floor space that we just don't have. Um, so I'm going to offer that on the table as well as um, uh, that, that might be something to lay on top of whatever your science is. At what point is it a real kind of ridiculous to keep hanging on to it? And let's just call it mm -hmm. and kill it. Like John said, pull the weed. <laughs> be heartless be heartless because you need the shelf space and you need you need you need the lab space yeah not everything is worth keeping <laughs> <laughs> okay i know we are coming up here on um four o'clock um sarah and jeff would either of you have time to stay on a little bit longer sure. we still have some questions here absolutely no problem at all here yeah i'm good I'm Great. Good. Thank you both. Okay. So we're going to stay a little bit longer so you can hopefully get through. I think we'll be able to get through all these questions here. Um, so there's a question here about where do you start with inventory as well as monitoring of the chemicals if there's no system in place? That's well, first, first thing is always um, <laughs> pick a system, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, because uh, in, in order to actually know what you're trying to track, you need, you need to understand where the requirements are. Uh, I mean, there are a variety of systems that are out there. I mean, everything from, uh, man, I, I have seen everything from, you know, the old Excel spreadsheet that's trying to track them. There's, you know, certainly a, a quick way of doing it. Um, right up through, you know, uh, boy, you know, the, the full integrated systems that companies can provide that uh, provide a good reporting capability or even alarms and alerts, depending on the areas and how it's configured. So it really depends on what you really need to have there. I mean, even a really, really rudimentary system, like if you're doing a, a known types of solvents and known types of materials, 
you paint stripes inside the cabinet and you just make sure that you don't cross over the side of your stripe, you know, so four bottles will fit here. You paint a spot for that. And if you get a fifth bottle, you're over the amount. Don't put it in, you know, uh, don't order that one. So it, 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 the starting point really is to come up with what is the right system that you need, depending on the complexity and how much you have and how many people and all that kind of stuff. And once you get that, then the second step is to work with the researchers to be able to understand what they actually have and where it goes. I'll also suggest um, there's a, uh, well, hopefully most of you are familiar with prudent practices in the laboratory. Um, National Academy of Sciences, NAS, it's a, actually a free, you can access it online through their, um, I forgot exactly the website, but uh, do a search on prudent practices. There's a really nice section with some color coded things where they talk about, you know, how to sort and how to sort things within a cabinet or on a shelf of a cabinet in order to keep good isolation. Uh, alphabetical is not a good sorting method for chemicals. Um. <laughs> This is one where I will, we normally keep product out of this, but I can't resist. ChemTracker is a solution. And we have some attendees on here who are ChemTracker users within, right, within the Biraft universe. Mm -hmm. um, that the storage codes in particular that you see in the Prudent Practices Handbook, that is courtesy of Stanford University, right? Our original creator <laughs> of ChemTracker here. And ChemTracker is a full database. We have those codes for all the chemicals, right? There's other systems out there as well. <laughs> encourage you to research them, but just I uh, need to plug that one a little here. Okay, great. Um, always love talking about inventory here. Um, next one, some groups like biologists and experimental physicists don't think hazmat rules apply to them because they aren't chemists. Well, we know that's not true. What do you say to researchers <laughs> in groups like this to educate them? I just got done doing that this week. I guess I'll just share what works for me. I'm, I'm humble enough to know there's many ways to do this. Okay. So um, I'll share what works and what worked for me this week. Um, Jeff, you feel free to pile on. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, find some common ground and start with basics rather than diving into technical mumbo jumbo babble, which overwhelms us all. Um, all of us expect to come to work or to school without getting hurt. So let's agree on that. And we don't really want to hurt each other because why? That, that makes no sense. We care about each other. And beyond that, we care about our partnering labs or buildings, whatever your layout may look like. We care about the work that we're doing. We care about our neighbors and we care about the people we impact like the community, our environment and first responders. For some reason, when I mentioned first responders, and that was the magic word this week that got me to get a group to listen to me, I, I, when I said and gave an example for a first responder, suddenly I had their attention. Um, I don't know what it is at common ground, but keep it that simple, and it's because we care. And because we care and we're responsible scientists or engineers, we're going to make sure that we manage the risk and that we're going to work together because it's an all-in effort to make sure that, that we don't hurt anybody or, or, or break the law, because we also don't want to break the law. There's no reason for that. If you start there, you can usually win most people. I mean, there's very few people out there that, that really want to hurt each other. I mean, that's, that's not really their intent. Now, we can argue about the work processes, the bureaucracy, or whatever they feel is there, but if you start in a place of care and wanting to do the right thing, we can usually pull people around. The second piece that works really well for me is showing people that what they do impacts what I just talked to you about. <laughs> I have, I, I process safety as an example, but you can use any system and just show it as a picture like bricks in an arch or pieces in a puzzle or, or whatever your picture is and, and put some words to it, following procedures, training, um, um, you know, managing my inventory, um, you know, you, you can put different parts, whatever you feel is part of this program and firefighting, emergency response, incident reporting and investigation. I think we mentioned management of change that could end up in there. Whatever your words are that make sense to your stakeholders, put that in a puzzle or, or, or a box or something so people understand this is what it takes to do what we just discussed, which is be responsible. For whatever reason, that elevator pitch you get people's attention and then we can move forward. But if you can't get them in that space, 
it's going to be difficult because we're going to be focused on the bureaucracy or the steps they don't like or something else. And that's what's worked for me. So Jeff, I mean, what, what else would you offer? I'm not going to try to add anything to that. That's the great answer. So for that matter, you even gave me some ideas there. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that and learn from it. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent here. Okay, there's a question about what are some recommended certifications for laboratory staff or folks in general who work with hazardous materials? We got some great, great suggestions here from some of our audience members. Carmen written CHMM, CIH, GOT, RICRA, CHMP. Linda had stressed a 30 hour OSHA training and uh, the chemical hygiene officer training, even getting the CCHO. Anything mm -hmm. else, um, Jeff or Sarah, you'd like to suggest for folks looking to? to get certifications that are, are gonna be relevant and useful there. Gosh, you, you hit so many of them. Um, again, I come back to what problem is it you're trying to solve, right? Um, I myself have a few alphabets uh, behind my name. I don't know if that makes me wiser though. So are you looking for knowledge or wisdom? And if you're hoping for wisdom, I would suggest, you know, besides hoping that people get the right experiences, right? Make sure they're, they're getting the right experiences to use their knowledge. Um, I would suggest that sometimes it's time to pull a day workshop together or a half day workshop together and, and talk about kind of what I just laid out. Why are we doing this? What are the parts of this? How do we work together to use all this knowledge we have to, to, to meet a common aim? Um, uh, make sure you're balancing that correctly because you can have an awful lot of knowledge um, but you're maybe not getting the benefits that you want out of that although all those certificates are fantastic they really are yeah yeah and i i, I mean it's the the list that's on the chat right there or in the questions and answers rather i mean that that's a very good comprehensive list and unfortunately the answer there also is really it depends because you know um trying to take the OSHA 30 hour training for all of the lab staff is probably not gonna resonate really well when they get into things like fall protection and stuff if you're only working on a benchtop fume hood. Um, you know, the concepts are still good and the concepts of risk management on that certainly are still good. But the, you know, uh, you know having somebody who understands things like CIH uh, or, you know, the CCHM or CCHMM type things, certainly applies really well if you're looking at like the chemistry labs or things but if you're a biology lab you still have some of the chemistry stuff but you also may have some bio things that you might need and i don't know my bio certificates at all but but it really is going to depend on that um you know the the ccho i think is a really really strong one pretty widely in a lot of laboratories okay great um, let's see this next question. So this is from Tiffany Nelson. Hi, Tiffany. Tiffany was on um, one of our recent webinars here. What are your thoughts on having shared chemical storage among researchers? I'm actually in favor of it. Um, you know, the, the, the big challenge to overcome on that is budget. Because if you're in a system where everybody has their own limited budget and you don't want somebody to like mess around and take like my high purity heptane and, and use it in your experiment, that creates a little bit more of a problem. But if you can get to the point where that an overall inventory can be managed, where you can actually keep things together, it limits the number of cabinets, it puts better uh, compatibility of things because you now can lump everything together in the right spot. Um, and it can minimize quantities because you don't have to have your three redundant bottles and Sarah wouldn't need her three redundant bottles when we can have two bottles and only three redundant bottles and still very effectively do all our lab work. So if you can get to that, that's awesome. But trying to get to that with some of the budget type stuff, it's really gonna be a challenge and how, how you can get everybody to play fair. Yeah, and what I'd add on that, Jeff, is um, this, this may be a challenge for you, maybe not, depends on the, the research group, but um, make sure that you deal with the organizational challenges that might occur if you share the same space. Mm. So sometimes good fences make good neighbors and you need a policy document that you are reviewing at some frequency with the right stakeholders. How does one make decisions about what comes in or out? How, how, do, how do we share the milk, if you will, <laughs> amongst friends, right? Who then has right. to resupply it? Who buys it? Um, if you don't write some of that down and then return to that document 
from time to time, I think you're going to end up in some frustration um, unless you already have a very, uh, unless some of those things have already been worked out, right? And, and some of it depends on the personalities or the, the nature of, of the space, but don't forget about the organizational aspect. This, this uh, may require a little bit of what I'll say governance. If governance is the right word, you might need that. Thank you, absolutely. Okay, um, let's see. Next, we had a question here. Someone asked if, if there's any, they can ask technical questions about Bash's Chem Tractor. We'll say we won't have time for that on this webinar. Um, we have two email addresses, though, you can write, and those questions will get to me if you don't have ChemTracker yet. You want to email info at, or sorry, sales at buyeroft.com. And if you have ChemTracker already, our support team is going to be your, your resource. It'll be support at buyeroft.com, and I'll put those, those email addresses in here as well. And it looks like our last question, which is good because we are, we are over time here. Um, Jeff asked, you said, I didn't make part one. Well, Jeff, we're glad we have you for part two. And he wanted to know about liquid storage cabinets. We delegated authority to, to regulate campus labs with the IFC. They're using code year 2018. NFPA and CFR's OSHA standards do not require self-closing doors. Since a cabinet allows 100% increase in MAQs, I believe they should be self-closing similar to the door in a control area. Can you share professional opinion, please? So that, that, that's an easy one. Um, as an EHS professional, I absolutely agree. And I, I love self-closing doors on cabinets. As a former researcher, I absolutely hate self-closing doors on cabinets. Um, what I would suggest on that is the big challenge with the self-closing doors is that when you try to open it up to like take a glass bottle out and put it into spill containment and stuff, the doors tend to want to close on you. So recognizing that most of the closers have like a fusible link in the, you know, and teaching people that there is a fusible link that they can hold it open long enough to get their material out is a good start. The other thing is that the force required to open those doors, um, if your cabinet's not stable, you are pulling now on a door with a whole bunch of hazardous chemicals that are going to fall toward you. One of the things that I've seen that's very effective on this is if you take a piece of angle iron and you mount it above the cabinet, so you're not modifying the cabinet, you're not doing anything, but if you have you know, the, the cabinet itself, you just put a piece of angle iron mounted to the wall above it, so if it tries to tip up, it hits the angle iron and can't tip toward you. So it's uh, without having to modify the cabinets or doing anything, you can still scoot them in and out underneath the, the, the bracket. You know, even though it's like a shelf bracket right there would still prevent the cabinet from tipping, but without actually having to drill into the cabinet. And that makes it for so much better when you try to open it and you don't have to worry about the cabinet coming over on top of you with a bunch of chemicals. Great considerations here. Okay, so anything you wanna add or we're covered on self-closing doors? No, Jeff, for some reason, the, didn't NFPA 30 just updated a requirement on that? No, uh, 30, the, the comment there from Jeff was correct. For yeah. flammable yeah. cabinets, OSHA and 30 both still do not have self-closing doors. For hazmat cabinets out of NFPA, I want to say 400, you do have self-closing doors as a requirement. Okay. So got that, re oh, just heads up, I just wanted yeah. to... Yeah, it, it, there's. I can't look up a code that fast. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's yeah, there's there's definitely some some conflicts even on how the cabinets have to be labeled. Yeah. And again, it comes down to that communications, working with your authority, having jurisdiction to understand how you can best control those hazards. Um, you know, I think with those you know suggestions I had in terms of the how to make the cabinets more effective for the researcher certainly helps those things and makes them a little more usable. I really, really like the self-closing doors from an EHS perspective because that limits how much is going to be involved in a fire if there is one. Absolutely. That's the only thing is it is confusing. I look it up every time. And that's why I'm just heads up for the rest of the group. Watch out. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Some gotchas there. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. I know John had to drop, but thank you to John, Jeff, and Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, you all are excellent. Thank you for your time and to our audience, thank you so much for taking the time um, to attend today. I'm gonna to show in terms of our next webinars we have scheduled. Um, our next ones, we have two product webinars. One is about ChemTracker, so I'll be on that webinar. And that's gonna be on Thursday, March 24th, same time. 
And then uh, a few weeks later, we're gonna have a product webinar on the Biopt inspection module. So the announcement's still coming about our next community webinar. Don't worry, those are not ending here. And again, thank you so much, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Very good. Take care, all. Take care, everybody. Bye.